Greetings on this first Sunday in Lent as we make our journey to the Paschal Mystery during these six weeks. The temptation of Jesus in the wilderness has always been the gospel for the first Sunday in Lent, and it is magnificent in every way. For one, it describes a journey, a journey into the wilderness, in which Jesus begins his trek to inheriting for us through his death the promised land. And so in a way, what you see in the journey of Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan is a recapitulation of Israel's journey. We also have the journey of baptism. Most people don't realize today, and many of you probably already know this, but Lent was primarily at the very beginning, a baptismal season, a season to prepare catechumens for their final move towards the font at the Paschal Vigil. And so the accents during Lent were baptismal, and the penitential journey was really a secondary, if not minor, part of Lent. But there is also this battle with Satan, where Jesus goes into the wilderness to take on Satan, and his struggles in the wilderness, his fasting, his hunger, and the temptations for 40 days and 40 nights are, in a sense, the, the archetype of the type of temptations that we experience in this life, although Jesus does it perfectly and without sin, and he conquers Satan. That's one of the other great themes of the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, the Christus victor that he can overcome Satan here and throughout the gospel that points to his final triumph in that ironical, tr tremendously misunderstood moment of crucifixion where in p pathetic humiliation and agony and suffering, he actually defeats Satan on behalf of us. It is, it is a remarkable way to begin this very, very important season. And one thing that I think we should keep in mind as we go along is that the psalm that is cited by Satan here, Psalm 91, is the soldier's psalm. And from the very beginning, the church has taken this psalm and made it the psalm of Lent, that this is the psalm that accompanies us in the journey. And the antiphon for the introit in the first Sunday in Lent is so important for us as we begin to look at this text where it says, he will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now that is the song that we sing as we go through this season of Lent, following Jesus, our captain in the well-fought fight, as we make our way to Easter and the celebration of the Paschal mystery. The one great theme here, as we now turn to the text, <clears throat> is that the central temptation of Jesus by the devil is to bypass the cross, to grab the glory now, to, to actually show himself to be the conquering Son of Man, the Son of God who, in fact, has come to vindicate the, 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 uh, the righteous ones. And if he does give in to these temptations, then he basically precludes any sort of, of um, possibility of our redemption at the cross. So it's absolutely critical for him to say, no, I must make this journey, I must suffer, I must, I must struggle, I must make my way to the place where I have been destined by my Father. Now, the structure here is very simple, and <clears throat> you know it quite well, I'm sure. First of all, you have the introduction here. And this introduction is, I think, one in which you can see very clearly that it simply sets up the framework for the text. Uh, Jesus is mentioned here by name, which is, I think, very important to see him being named. He will be named later on. Here is where we see for the first time, and I think he's going to be referred to four times as the devil. One time as Satan. Um, <clears throat> we see here the place in the wilderness. So he is in the wilderness. And he is under the power of the Spirit. Now that's a very important thing. 
you, you know I'm a Luke guy, and, and the Spirit is very, very important in Luke, and, and he's led by the Spirit everywhere. And here you can see that same theme is articulated in Matthew. Um, and then the 40 days and the 40 nights, you know, he was tempted. And there's, there's in a sense, the great theme, that he is the one who is tempted on behalf of us. Um, the, uh, the, the, the rest of the text now, is to, um, <clears throat> to show us how it is that he is tempted in the, the three different temptations. Sorry, I'm struggling here a little bit with this. The, and the temptations here. Um, you can see that the first temptation starts here in three, okay? And it has to do with the bread. Um, the next temptation starts here in five, and I can't get everything on the board, so I'll just leave it there. And this is, of course, the holy city. And then the, the third temptation starts in verse eight and nine and ten, where he's taken to the holy mountain. Now, here, here's one of the, the interesting things about this that I think we have to, we have to recognize. And it, it's very important to see this. One is, in the first two temptations, he is spoken by the devil as, if you are the Son of God. And that happens, you can see in verse 6, if you are the Son of God. Now, interestingly, it doesn't happen in the third temptation, where he takes him up into the, into the high mountain. Um, that, that is sort of a curious thing here. Um, in some ways, these first two temptations are, in a sense, the most difficult for him. Um, you, you can hear a lot of allegorizing on what these things mean and how people translate them into today. I'll, I'll let you read the commentaries for that. But I do think that there is something to be said here about the fact that, um, that you, you really have two sort of iconic moments here. W one is, um, the, the bread, the bread is so important. It's very hard not to have all this text on the line here. Hold on. Hold on. I'm getting there. Here we go. Um, where's the bread? Here's the bread, yeah. Okay. The bread is iconic. You can just see that. Uh, it, it is so iconic because it is the you know the 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 fundamental um, way in which after sin we we nurture ourselves. Bread is is the food of sin, and here Jesus is is being tempted to 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 take a stone and turn it into bread, and and here you can see, and this is in Matthew, it's not in Luke, the the citation that that you know. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I don't know how Matthew uses this word, but hremati in Luke is usually used in association with his, his passion, with his suffering. And here you can see that really what the bread is about, for my money, is about how Jesus is our food. He is the bread of life. And I think certainly the Lord's prayer is in place here. And the Word of God, which is Jesus, the living Word, the Word of suffering, is what we commune on, and not on the bread that, that um, simply fills our bodies. Now, again, the, the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, it goes to the really heart of who Jesus is, as the, the one who is the bread of life. Then, in this next pericope, next pericope, next temptation, you have Jesus as the Son of God again, but the location is the holy city. Now, you, you know, you can, you, can, um, you can think about this, the temple, the pinnacle of the temple. I mean, what is the issue here? The issue is presence. And, you know, one of the great themes I think of the scriptures, of the Gospels, is the, the notion that there's a shift in the locale of God's presence, that God is somewhere 
now that he has never been before. That is in the body of Jesus, who is the bread of life. And here the devil is tempting him to, you know, to, to, to show himself in the holy city, in the temple, the place of presence, to, to be Yahweh, to, to be the, the great son of God, to, you know, and that, that God will protect him. Now, we know he misquotes the psalm, which is very typical of the devil. And I think it's, it's significant that, that you have the focus here first on bread and then on presence. Um, the final temptation, of course, and many people have pointed this out, is on a mountain. And that's, that is a, a prominent Matthean theme. You know, you obviously have the Sermon on the Mount. You have Matthew 28, where in that, what I call a church order, um, he gives his final sort of um, ecclesial instructions to the apostles as to what apostolic ministry is going to be about. Um, I think what you have there is how you do church. You have baptizing. You have teaching at the table. You even have, Lo, I am with you always to the end of the earth, I think is a reference to the fact that, that Christ is with us in the bread, that, that it's, a, it's a Eucharistic reference. Um, what I find fascinating here is that um, Luke describes him as the devil, and then Jesus speaks of him as Satan. And then he uses, and he's used this once before. Notice Jesus here. I'm always interested in titles. Titles are everything. Here he speaks of himself as Yahweh. And Yahweh is everything. Yahweh is the one who is um, the expected one to come. And Jesus speaks of himself here as Yahweh. I think you can see up here a little earlier that he has spoken to himself as Yahweh. So this isn't the first time that he has spoken of himself as Yahweh. Okay, here, I'm trying to get this here. Here we go. Yeah. Um, where is it? Ah, hold on, hold on. It's in verse 7. Here we go. I didn't highlight it. Yeah, he did. Here it is, Yahweh. Here and here, Yahweh, Lord God. Now, I think that's important. I think that's something that you really need to pay attention to. And one of the things I would do in this text is just sort of follow the titles. Notice it ends with devil, you know. So, I mean, he, he comes back to that. He uses it four times and once Satan. Yahweh twice, and I think he uses... Um, He uses, um, that's the mouse. There we go. Uh, he uses Jesus there at the beginning in verse 7, and that's it. So he uses Jesus twice. Now, I, I find those things to be very interesting, and, and I, I think that they're very instructive for us in terms of what Matthew is trying to say to us. Now, I think one of the mistakes that one can make on this text is to spend time sort of working through them temptation by temptation. I've read many sermons on these, and oftentimes they just turn into, you know, a kind of a predominance of law. Um, I, I think one of the ways in which I would approach this text is to, to accent the larger themes of journeying into the wilderness, battle with Satan, Jesus defeating Satan here by, by refusing to bypass the cross and, to, and to, to go into the sufferings. And one thing that I would, I would keep in mind, and this is how I'll close, um, remember that the hymn of the day for Lent 1 is a mighty fortress is our God. Now, I would, I would definitely sing that, and I might reference that in my sermon as being sort of the perfect Lenten him, certainly the perfect hymn for this first Sunday in Lent. And so a familiar text to all of us, but a text that is so important as we enter into this holy season. 
as we prepare for the Paschal mystery, as we see Jesus moving for us into the wilderness to do what only he could do, and that is to be tempted as we are without sin. And we will see in a very short time how we will celebrate his death and even more his resurrection as we rejoice in our common salvation in Jesus Christ, the one who was tempted and conquered.